Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, sun's shining today. We haven't seen it for a while. I noticed on my um, on the solar system on the top of my house, it's been the output's been very low. <laughs> And I can tell that the sun's not shining without opening the door. But we have sunshine today. This is uh, the day that the Lord has made. And the scripture said, let us be glad and rejoice in it. Recognizing that we have life and breath um, that comes from the Lord. Um, hopefully we rise and we count our blessings to see that the Lord has truly uh, been with us and blessed us tremendously. Certainly above that which we deserve. Uh, many times we feel that we don't deserve the least of His blessings, but He's that His mercy and His grace toward us abounds. Um, I ask that you pray for me for what time I stand before you this morning. I, unlike the last few weeks, uh, I I looked and looked and looked last night, and nothing nothing appealed uh, to my mind. So I'm waiting on the Lord this morning to. Uh, give me a message that would minister to your needs. Um, as I was sitting on the front pew just a minute ago, I was was thinking about this cancer business and all the all the people that we are learning that have one type of cancer or another. And, and I've tried to determine what's the root cause of all of this. Well, sin is the root cause, uh, but I think that at the same time that we're probably putting things in our body that we shouldn't be, we're eating things that we shouldn't be, and I, I don't intend to meddle uh, or to get into anybody's business if you want to sit down and eat Blue Bell ice cream, uh, the whole gallon, I don't care. That's your business. But I'm, I'm afraid that uh, greed has led a lot of people to do things with our food supply that they probably shouldn't be. You know, we hear about light bread. I remember when we were growing up, my mother would always call it light bread. Well, it was white bread, and it was, it was pretty good to the taste. But there were a lot of the nutrients that were left out uh, of that type of bread, un unlike whole wheat or whole grain where you find all the good things that we need, not necessarily um, the best tasting, but nonetheless it was better for you. And we find that because of greed, uh, people have done things to our food supply, and because now here we have people that are living in city situations where they're gathered so much closer together, uh, they wanted to make food that had shelf life. In order for food to stay on the shelf longer, they have to put ingredients in there that I don't think were ever intended to go into our body. Um, I'm not going to labor long on, on this, but you just pick up anything in the grocery store, a can of green beans or whatever, and there's probably some ingredients in there besides green beans. I'm thinking if I'm buying green beans, I should expect to see green beans in there, but you're seeing all kinds of ingredients that would probably take a pharmacologist to be able to pronounce the words, and they're put in there as a preservative. Uh, just about everything that we take off the shelf. It makes, it makes us think of a more pristine time when, when uh, and most of us probably couldn't live off the land the way that we uh, that people used to. You had to live off the land. Before the advent of the industrial age, you probably lived on a farm. 
you probably raised your you raised cattle or and and goats for goat's milk and and cheese and you did you farm the land and you raised your own crops and and uh, that's how you got by and we probably didn't have very many instances of of cancer back then like we do today now I'm disturbed to find out that our government has passed a bill that any meat that's imported uh, they don't have to tell us where it came from so uh, this is something that just happened I guess in the last six or eight weeks ago so now that when we go to the grocery store we don't know where the meat came from a lot of things are happening and happening in the political world that are just uh, that really don't surprise me that that go hand in hand with the description of the depravity of man that God describes in, in his word and because of the love of money uh, you see one of the things that they've done for the love of money is is uh, creating hybrid uh, hybrid seeds I remember even as a young uh, young child that we used to travel back from Amarillo to Texaco New Mexico and there were a lot of corn fields or maize and, and different wheat fields and I would always see these signs to talk about this hybrid you know they were advertising this field has got this hybrid seed being planted here and so on and there was a lot it seemed like a lot of competition between uh, everyone but you know I think that's something that actually that God warns us not to do not to mingle seed and uh, men have been doing that genetically altering the, the seeds that are being planted in the ground and, and uh, a lot of such things like that are taking place uh, but it goes hand in hand with the greed of men when they realize that if they can uh, they can crossbreed seeds and they can get say 10 bushels per acre versus 5 bushes, bushels per acre with the true and the pure seed they're going to go for the genetically altered seed and I think that's that's part of the part of the reason some of the the, the stuff that we're eating and ingesting is not real food. It, I'm just going to call it fake food, and I don't really have an, an answer for that or how that we could. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying that they need to to take in organic, uh, buy organic vegetables and things like that. But even then, you can't be assured. That the seed is pure and that it's that it doesn't have pesticides on it and there's so many different things. I, I think that's part of the answer of uh, the reason that that. Uh, but still, e even with all that and, and the suffering that comes along with it, uh, by and large, God's people have been blessed to to live long lives. I think the scripture talks about David said, "If uh, if a man's years be." Uh, three score and ten and by reason of strength four score so if we live to be 80 years old I feel like we've been blessed of the Lord and uh, we need to be thankful for that so uh, the, the Lord's in control of all of this the Lord is suffering these things to take place for uh, for a reason and oftentimes we don't really understand why but nonetheless the the challenge that the enemy made against the Most High God uh, and w which caused him to be cast out of heaven uh, God is going to suffer it to play out uh, but the good news of, of all this when we see all the chaos that takes place in the world is to the good news is that we have a hiding place in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and we, can, we can run to him and, and he can be our, our strength and, and uh, all of these things if we begin to try to worry about them or concern ourselves with them will overwhelm us uh, God is greater than all those things that take place out of there and and here again is is the uh, the teaching that we the Lord says come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light so we need to learn more about the Lord and we need to uh, and the only way that I think that we can do that is by reading his word and talking to him about it and asking him what what does this mean I open this book and there are some places in, he in here that literally scare me it caused me to tremble and there are some places in there that, that I read and make absolutely no sense and it's probably it's due to the fact that God has not revealed it to me uh, I don't know any man 
that has all knowledge and understanding of this book. But it's a very, very marvelous, marvelous book. It is intended to last us a lifetime. And I think one of the things that it's intended to do is to put us in our place to recognize that God that we serve is sovereign over us and that He is a potter and we're the clay. Uh, and do you realize that the Scripture says that we are His workmanship? He's made each and every one of us exactly who He wants us to be in Christ Jesus. Uh, he says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are His creation, and the Scripture says that it's God that has is, that is made us or created us and not we ourselves. We like to, uh, like to take pride, or men like to take pride in their ability. And, you know, I hear some people say, I've gone to college, and I'm a self-made man, and, and I have all this wisdom. No, not so. Uh, God calls the wisdom of this world foolishness. and uh, But we... We've been, we are His creation, and we've been placed in Christ Jesus, and God has set the members in the body wheresoever it has pleased Him. That's talking about the, the place where your membership is, where you're at. God has placed you here. So it is it's not me for me or anyone else to set the members in the body, but Christ Himself. So we're, we're beloved of the Lord. We're His workmanship. Um, we've been created in Christ Jesus and we are going to be conformed to His image and His likeness. And, and that's a blessing that's, uh, uh, that we, we are not going to realize right now. At best, what we can realize while we walk in this life as we struggle against the flesh, the world, the devil, is we have the earnest of our inheritance which is the pledge or the down payment that God has given us. He's given us the Holy Spirit, and which is like when you buy a house, you put down earnest money. And that's your pledge that you're going to go through with the deal. And God is pledged by giving us the Holy Spirit um, that He's going to go through with what He's promised. The Scripture says that He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And that He's going to come back at the appropriate time and then he's going to take us home and that's what we look for that's what we anticipate but we have the gift we have the gift of the Holy Ghost or the gift of the Holy Spirit and he says in one place if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him and I think that one of the things that God's people fail to do especially we need, a, need Him now, especially more than we ever have, uh, looking at the condition of the world, is that we need to, to rise every day and ask the Lord for the leadership of His Holy Spirit to, to help us to guide our steps and, uh, and to be our confidence and go with us during the day, uh, to be our wisdom. And, because if we don't have that, I feel like the world will just swallow us up. But it's a precious gift that God has given us that no one can take away from you. Uh, just as Paul and Silas were singing and they were in prison and they were shackled uh, their feet were shackled together and, and uh, they weren't going anywhere but they were able to praise God you see they say back in 1963 I guess when, whenever it was that Madeline Murray O'Hare had prayer through the Supreme Court decision had prayer taken out of the school you really you can't take prayer out of anyone's heart uh, I guarantee you cannot do that. The devil cannot do that. And that's a gift that God has given every one of his people. Even though they may not have been able to publicly assemble together or have teacher-led prayer. Those, even today, children are still allowed to pray in, in school. They just can't have teacher-led prayer. Uh, <clears throat> but prayer is something that no one can take from you. And it's a, it's a gift of God and it's part of part of that package that God gives us when we're born of the Spirit of God, that faith that when we can look look to Him and we can ask Him questions. And I, I think the problem is, though, a lot of the time that we want to try to solve problems on our own basis and try to work through them ourselves. And, well, you, you think, I'll, I'll just wait until the big problem comes along and then I'll ask the Lord about that. 
But I think that we need to condition ourselves to Lord, involve the Lord in what we would term the small things as well. Uh, is, is anything too big for the Lord? Or is anything too small for God? Uh, I don't think so. so and, and I think that, like I said, that helps condition us and helps nurture the relationship that, that the Lord desires that we have with Him. Let's involve Him and let's talk to Him uh, about, the, about the small things as well. Don't, don't think that you've got to, well, I, I'm going to uh, hold off and wait till I have a big problem. Uh, before I talk to the Lord, uh, talk to Him about the small things too, and share those things with Him. So w- we have we have the gift of the Holy Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, to guide us each and every day, and and it's it's the earnest of our inheritance, and, and that inheritance that God has given us, that's as an inheritance where thieves don't break through our steel and rust and uh, rust and Moth and rust do not corrupt, and thieves don't break through and steal. That's an inheritance that's in heaven. He says it's incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. That is what the Apostle Peter says. We have a reservation that's been made, and no one's going to change that reservation. And we have a place that's been prepared. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. Isn't that a wonderful thought to know that the Lord has prepared a place for each and every one of us in heaven and immortal glory? And, and unlike what I've heard some people say recently, they, there's this doctrine of the five crowns that's going around that thinks that, well, if I do special works down here, that when I get to heaven, I'm going to have, I'm going to have all these crowns that I'm going to be wearing. Well, I think that any crowns that the, that the Scripture speaks of, it, those are the ones that we receive in this lifetime. Because I read about a place there in the book of Revelation where, in the, where the 20 and 4 elders cast their, stand up and they come before the throne of God and they cast their crowns before the throne in full submission to the authority and the sovereignty of God, uh, recognize Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And if any, if there are any crowns, uh, I would say that it would be that it's the blessing to know that Jesus is ours because He has purchased us. He has redeemed us. He has bought us with His own blood. If there's any crown, it's to know that when, we, when it comes to that time that we pass from this life to the next, that the Lord will be there with us to give us peace and grace and that we won't be afraid. If there's any crown to be had in this life, it's to, uh, to recognize that Jesus did a perfect work and that we can rest in His finished work. Uh, I don't believe that there are any re- degrees of reward in heaven. And basically that's what the five crown doctrine teaches, that there will be different rewards in heaven, that I'll, I'll have more crowns than you or you'll have more crowns than me. And there may be some of us that don't have any crowns and we're just in a little corner over. I don't believe that. And the, the one thing that, that obliterates that idea is the fact that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ in heaven and immortal glories. There will no be no big eyes, no little U's. We'll all be uh, there. Will be equality uh, amongst us. So uh, that's an idea that I know that uh, uh, it's a pseudo works doctrine. And when I say pseudo, that means it's fake. It's it's a they the people that teach it start out by saying you're saved by grace, but it's it's one of those you're saved by grace but doctrines. <laughs> But if, but you got to if you want crowns you got to do this and that. But I believe that that if there are any crowns that are earned in this lifetime, that they'll all be cast at the feet of Jesus, and that He only will be uh, will be crowned uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, all these shall bow, and every, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess uh, that Jesus is Lord. So we have. We have the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We, we have the knowledge to know that. Excuse me. We have the knowledge to know that we've been redeemed uh, by Christ, uh, and that His His redemption is a perfect work in every regard. And there's nothing left. There's nothing left to add to it. He's not waiting for anyone 
to accept him or anyone to believe or 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 anyone to have faith before the they uh, for the order for them to get into into heaven because it's his work alone by the grace of God alone that we can enter into heaven because we're told in so many different places that there are no works that our works cannot merit uh, heaven and immortal glory. Now I don't need to with this group. I don't need to go over those texts. You should know them very well. I hope that you have them memorized. Uh, but. The Lord did a perfect work, and and I'm so thankful this morning that I have that knowledge. And if I'm not deceived in my heart, we are all resting. Uh, He says there remaineth a rest for the people of God. Uh, And if we're resting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe that His grace was sufficient in in order to redeem us from from the hand of the devil, uh, we can find rest. And uh, the Apostle Paul, it almost seems like a contradiction in terms, uh, but Paul says, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. It, it, is a, it is a labor before we can get to that point because we have to cast off human pride. We have to cast off the, the thoughts and the ideas that our works, that we can help just help the Lord out. You know, the Lord tried to save us and He got us so far, but he's just, he, we just need to kind of help Him out. Uh, we need to cast that off. And that's part of the labor of entering into that rest is working through working through those things and, and casting them off and trusting wholly in what He has done. When the scripture says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, I believe that. That he actually he did save his people. And, and the scripture says in another place in the book of Timothy, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And that was said in response to uh, when Paul was writing about uh, was it Hymenaeus and Philetus that were teaching that the resurrection was past. And they overthrew the faith of some. But he says, nevertheless, even though if some had fallen away from the faith, if, even though if some had, had were no longer in the church, he said, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. It, it's the God. The, the, uh, he says, for the Lord knoweth them that are His. God has a perfect intimate knowledge of each and every one whose names were penned in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world and nothing can change that that's the foundation of God that stands sure but you think about that uh, a little bit then when was it Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Philetus that were teaching the resurrection was passed well why would where would they get that idea that the resurrection was past. Well, you know, there there has already been, there are several resurrections taught in the scripture. The new birth is is referred to as a resurrection. Uh, when he said, "You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins," so that's a resurrection. And there we're expecting a resurrection at the end of time uh, when the just and the unjust will be raised at the second time. But I think that where Hymenaeus and Philetus had the idea that the resurrection was past, you know there was a resurrection of the saints of God that uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he says he gave up the ghost, he says the rocks were rent and the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose after his resurrection, came out of the graves and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, I believe what this is, is the resurrection of the first fruits. So they probably had knowledge uh, of that and were thinking, well, there's the resurrection and it's already taken place. Well, there is a resurrection that is past, but it's the resurrection of the first fruits. Uh, you, you come to understand uh, by studying the Word of God that Jesus fulfilled all the feast. Uh, that were mentioned over there. Uh, and when we say feast, we're talking about the Lord's appointed times. You look at Leviticus 23, and you had the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits, and the feast of Pentecost. Now, these were the the first three were the spring, and then one was the summer feast. Um, 
But the Lord fulfilled the feast of first fruits after he came out of the grave on the morning of the resurrection. Uh, I'm kind of just waiting on the Lord to guide me in this. I just need to follow this, I suppose. Uh, you remember when the Lord would, would came out of the grave and he saw Mary and he told Mary, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended, but go and tell your brethren that I go to my Father and so on. Now, the Lord was not getting ready to go make the atonement because that had already been made because when he was on the cross, remember, it says, and the veil in the temple, when he gave up the ghost, he said the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. That signifies the way into the most holy is made available for you and I. We couldn't go into that holy, uh, that most holy place, which we can, and we can come boldly before God's throne of grace today because Jesus uh, atone, made that atonement immediately upon his death. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews, he offered himself through the eternal spirit. He offered himself unto God. So immediately upon his death, that veil was rent, from top to bottom, signifying the way was open for you and I to come into that most holy place where before only the priest once a year could go, but now we can go. So that atonement was made there immediately upon the... And he entered once in the holy place, the scripture says, not the, not the, 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 uh, the veil that was in the... That was in the temple, in Herod's temple, but into heaven itself. He entered once into the holy place. Because all those things, the, the tabernacle, the temple, the holy place, the most holy place, all the furniture, all those things were types of Christ. And they were types of true things that are in heaven. So Christ went into, when he died, immediately when that veil was rent, it indicated that he had made the atonement. So what is it on the day of the resurrection when he told Mary, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. He has to make, one of the things about the first fruits is that he would take a, a wave off, he would do a wave offering of the, of the a crop, of the barley crop that had been marked out beforehand. And he would take it and he would present it to the Lord and he would wave it before the Lord. Now that is a type of of uh, of the Lord redeeming His people, and uh, remember the the scriptures talk in the book of Revelation about a hundred twelve thousand from every tribe of the hundred and forty four thousand. I believe that's probably about how many that came out of the graves after the Lord came out. The Lord was the first to rise from the dead to never die again. With Lazarus and Tabitha and all those others. They died again. But the Lord was the first to come out of the grave never to die again. So, but I believe that he offered, he ascended and he took those 144,000 with him and he offered them as, uh, as the first fruits of the crop that was to come later. Okay, and that's and meaning at the, the, the last day of the general resurrection. So if Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching that the resurrection was past. They were partially true, uh, but if, if they were teaching that the the general resurrection was past, that is error. Uh, and I, I know that there are some people that take a position that's called uh, uh, praetorism. Praetorism teaches that the resurrection is past. Praetorism teaches that the second coming has already taken place. And they tie those things strictly to the to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, I don't buy into that because that just kind of wipes out all hope for the children of God. If to say that there's no resurrection that that we're anticipating or looking for, and the the Lord's not coming back, that just kind of destroys all of our hope, doesn't it? But nonetheless, there are people out there that that sincerely believe those teachings, and they're not understanding that they that. Those things that happened in AD 70 were prefiguring the end of time and when the Lord would come. Uh, there was a coming of the Lord in AD 70. The Lord came with clouds in judgment against Jerusalem uh, for killing all the righteous prophets and, and, uh, and all of those things, which, which is another subject. I don't want to get too far off into that. But the Lord did come in the clouds uh, um, there was a resurrection after he came out of the grave and the Lord did come to destroy 
um, Jerusalem in AD 70, and that's what uh, the Lord told, was it um, uh, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, that you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. Well, it does, and if you look in the Old Testament, there are a lot of different uh, places where, the, where it says that God came in clouds and that He came to judge in clouds. It doesn't mean that the Lord literally came. It means that it was God's judgment that came against the, the nation of, uh, of Israel and the Jews. Um, and this was the true Reformation period. So th- there was a resurrection of the first fruits. And I believe that the Lord fulfilled first fruits just as we believe He fulfilled Passover and unleavened bread. I believe that He fulfilled first fruits, and that those those that came out of the grave were presented unto God. Uh, the Scripture will bear this out. You can look it up for yourselves, and I encourage you to do that very thing. Uh, I, I'll tell you again. You've heard me say many times, you should not believe everything that I tell you without checking it out. Uh, you, you have, God has given you sharp minds, He's given you intellect, He's given you the gift of His Holy Spirit, and you can read the Bible, and you can pray, and you can see whether the things that I'm telling you are so. That's what Paul said, uh, the, the testimony of, he says, the Berarians, they were more noble than those of Thessalonica, and that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether the things that Paul said were so. So, in other words, they heard Paul, but they checked Paul out. Okay, so but he said those in Thessalonica, they must have been lazy. That's all I can figure, because the Berarians were no, more noble than those in Thessalonica. We do, because they searched the Scripture. So obviously the, Thess- the Thessalonians were not checking out the Scripture. They weren't checking to see if the things that the Apostle Paul was saying was so. And that's so important, especially in the day and age that we live, that you don't don't trust your pastor to do all your studying for you. You need to be in the uh, you need to be in the scripture yourself. And you can see these things, the Lord can show them to you. So, uh, yes, there was, there was a resurrection, uh, uh, and it did overthrow the faith of some, but he said, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth that them that are His. Now, if the Lord knows them that are His, how long do you suspect that He's known them? Uh, he's known them from all eternity past, hasn't He? Well, is anything that I do, or, or that I preach to, or anything that anyone else does going to... if, if can I preach? Can I? If I preach hard enough, can I get some more in that Lamb's Book of Life? Or, or if I preach, uh, if I preach Christmas too hard and everybody leaves, are they going to fall out of the Lamb's Book of Life? No, they're not. He said, "Nothing that we can do can change that number." The Lord knows them. He's, and, and that word knoweth. Uh, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, for whom He did foreknow. He also did predestinate. And that that idea carries with it intimacy. The Lord is intimate with His people. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. When the angel Gabriel was talking to Mary, said that she would, the Holy Ghost would, uh, that she would be with child. And she says, well, how shall this be seen? I know not a man. It didn't mean that she didn't have knowledge of, of men. When she said, I know not a man, it means that she was not intimate with a man. She understood what it takes, the natural process that God has put in place in order to procreate. She knew what that was. And she knew that she was a virgin and she had not been with a man. She had not known a man. Another place, uh, uh, it's rather crude, but you find in the book of Judges, chapter 19 and also in the book of Genesis. Uh, you remember when the, the two angels came to Lot's house and uh, and the men of the city saw the angels come into Lot's house and they beat on the door and said, send those men out that we might know them. Well, they didn't want to they didn't want to shake hands and find out what their politics were and where they're from and you know about their, talk about their family. No, they wanted to sodomize them. 
Okay, that's where we get that word sodomy because they wanted to sodomize those men. And Lot said, brethren, do not so wickedly. He said, let me send my daughters out uh, and you do whatsoever you please with them. Uh, but, it, but anyway, that to send them out that we might know them, that's, that's talking about having intercourse with them. And Mary knew that she had not had intercourse with Joseph. Uh, now, the Lord being intimate with, the, and I, I don't mean, what I mean, um, don't take when it says the Lord knoweth them that are His, means that, that we're having any type of intercourse that we understand. We're, we have uh, we have a relationship with God, and it, it is an intimate relationship, but don't like it, don't tie that so hard to the natural procreation process that we understand. Don't tie it so hard. Uh, to that. Um, Jesus is not your boyfriend kind of thing, okay? Uh, So, anyway, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And that's what He said to some in one place, that those that were boasting of the works that they had done. Lord, uh, you know, they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. Uh, We've done many wonderful things in Your name. We've cast out, we've prophesied in Your name. We've cast out devil. We've done many wonderful works. And he professed unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so what is that about? And I think that's found in Matthew chapter 7 and maybe uh, one of the other Gospels. What is it that well, people are doing good works, supposedly in the name of the Lord, and the Lord calls it iniquity? Well, it's when, when people are refusing... I think, to rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ when they reject His work and saying, it's not good enough until I add something to it. I think that's work in iniquity. Uh, because I believe that Jesus has done all things well. Uh, I believe He said, I fit, He told the Lord in John chapter 17, I've finished the work which thou has given me. Uh, I've given eternal life to as many as thou has given me. He says He's lost nothing. Um, but to work, uh, to do good works, and for the Lord to identify it as works of iniquity, it means that you've rejected His work as being sufficient, or being uh, uh, being complete or perfect. Um, that that is when you stop to think about it, to think that the that you've got to do something to add to what the Lord had done. Uh, I don't think the Lord is very pleased with that. He saw in Isaiah, I believe in the 55th chapter, he's talking about he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Uh, I think that he saw uh, the suffering that he would go through on Calvary's cross and all the things that that he would uh, suffer at the hands of men. And he knew that when it was all over, uh, that he was satisfied. I believe that it, that saying that that atonement paid the sin debt for everyone for whom it was intended. If I, if I had, say, if we were God and you desired the uh, salvation of the entire world, which a lot of people teach, uh, and you lost just one, could you be satisfied? No, you wouldn't be satisfied. Well, he was satisfied because he knew that his, his atonement achieved the redemption of each and every one that he that he died for, and uh, but for us to say, well, it's we're really not saved until we have faith and get baptized, and then we persevere and we hold on to the way till the very end. And and if we do that, then we'll get you know, then we'll be saved. I think that's a work of iniquity. Uh, but we can rest. Brothers and sisters, we don't realize what a blessing it is to believe in salvation by grace alone, that we can rest in what the Lord has done. It, it's, it's finished. When he said it, it's finished. He didn't say there's more to add to it, and I'll tell you about it later. He said it's finished. What a blessing that is. But, you know, and then we have our brothers and sisters in the, uh, the denominational world. They come up with all kinds of things that you, you, you know, have to do. You have to repeat a, uh, the sinner's prayer. You have to answer an altar call. You have to say the, uh, the sinner's prayer. Or you you got to get baptized, and you got to do good works, and you got to maintain those good works. Uh, I know some um, 
friends that are in the Reformed Calvinist movement, and they say, well, we believe you're saved by grace, but now that once we're saved, we got to pick the ball up and run with it, or we could just fall away and lose it all. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I believe that the Lord's going to carry us all the way. Uh, he says we're, we're preserved in Christ Jesus. We're kept. We're kept by what? The power of God. The, the, the power of the, of the same God that spoke the heaven and earth into existence. And it, and it was. He, he spoke everything out of nothing. That same power is going to keep us. And he says, no man is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No man is able, nobody is able to do that. We're His. We're His purchased possession. We're His precious jewels. We're those that I, I trust that were spoken of in Malachi. It says, And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened. And a book of remembrance was written uh, regarding those that, that came together and spoke of the Lord. He says, And they shall be, I'm paraphrasing this, They shall be mine in the days when I make up my jewels, saith the Lord. No, we are His, and we, we trust Him for salvation. Um, and I'm so discouraged to see that there are so many that, that can't see the beauty. Uh, but it's human pride that says, well, well they, can't, they can't rightly divide the, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And that's really where it comes down to. Both are true. Both are taught. Both are taught in the scripture that God is sovereign and he, like in Daniel 4 all the inhabitants of the earth are, as, are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will among the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou? Yet at the same time the scripture teaches that men are, be, are to be responsible. But we know and understand that it's only those that are born of the spirit of God that have the capability to be uh, obedient and to be responsible to the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. It's only once we're born of the Spirit of God that we can understand the things of the Spirit of God. He says, What man knoweth the things of the Spirit, but he that has the Spirit? And so no man knows uh, uh, the Spirit of God, but the person that has the Spirit of God. You can't teach dead men the, the things of the Spirit. So men in pride, they, they, uh, they, don't, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They think when it says to believe, there's many places the Scripture says, well, let's think about this, Romans 1.18, I'm not uh, ashamed of the gospel. Uh, no. yeah, let, me go. let me go get that so I don't butcher that. Romans 1. Um, verse 18 says, no, that's not what I wanted. Was it verse 8? Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want you to notice something here. He says, the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth. It doesn't say it's the power of God to the unbeliever. Big difference. You, a man that's dead in trespasses and sins cannot believe on Jesus. You have to be born of the Spirit of God. And many people think that, well, my believing gets me born again. Well, that's also, I think, a work of iniquity too because we know that men are born again by the sovereign act or the sovereign voice of the Son of God when He speaks life to them. John 5, 25, John 6, 63. But what we have here in Romans 1, 16, when it says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, that's talking about sons that God has already created and given them the capacity to believe. It's talking about them becoming disciples and being converted. There's a difference between, become, between becoming a son and becoming a disciple. There's a difference between regeneration and conversion. And, and, uh, and regeneration and becoming a son, we are passive. 
That means we had nothing to do with it. We were only the objects of, of God's love and mercy. And, and at the time when it pleased God, He spoke life to us. Now, whereas discipleship and conversion, we have to be responsible, we have to be obedient, and we have work to do on that side. And we know that those works have nothing to do with getting us into heaven and mortal glory. So when the Lord tells those, depart from me, ye that work in equity, those are the people that are trying to work their way into heaven. Not right, They have it rightly divided. Now, uh, uh, there's a lot of different things uh, that we could talk about, but the Lord knoweth them that are His. He's always he's known them from all eternity. Nothing we can do is going to change that number. It's not, there's not going to be one added. There's not going to be one subtracted. And that blotting, that blotting out, you remember you read about people being blotted out of the book of God. Well, th there's got to be more than one book. I, I believe that there's a Lamb's book of life and that it, it's sealed with seven seals. Uh, and I don't think God opens it up and erases names or adds names when somebody makes an altar call. Um, over there in the great white throat judgment, it says, and the books were opened and the book of life. And I think, I think the book of life may, is, a, is wherein we're judged of the things that are written in this book right here. And d did you know? Now those people at the great white throne judgment were judged everyone according to their works. Uh, but I want you to know this. Uh, he says the dead, both small and great, stood before that throne. The dead, both small and great, stood before the throne. Now, who is, who is God? Is he, is he the God of the dead or is He the God of the living? He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. So it was the dead, both small and great, standing before that great white throne that were judged according to the works. And I suggest to you what we see over there is the left-hand view of Matthew chapter 25. When he divided the sheep from the goats, the sheep were put on his right hand, the goats were on his left hand, and I believe in Revelation 20, what you are seeing is the left-hand view of Matthew chapter 25. Because the, the books are already opened. Someone said, well, if uh, why is the book of life open there? Well, it's because... you. The Lord's got the books open. He's, uh, he's invited those on His right hand to come. Uh, and, and receive the uh, uh, kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. And he's fixing to tell those on his left hand to part into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So I suggest to you the next time that you read Revelation 20 and you get to that part and those people are judged according to their works, uh, uh, that's the left hand view of Matthew 25. Because brothers and sisters, if it comes to the time of the end and uh, if we're judged according to our works, we're toast. If we can't plead the blood and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and that His, if His blood has not washed our sins away and put them as far as the east is from the west, we're in trouble. If we weren't judged on Calvary's cross, and I believe that we were, that all of our sins were laid on Christ, we're in trouble. But I don't believe that we're in trouble. We're not going to be judged according to our... We are judged according to our works each and every day that we live. We shall stand before the... Uh, when you know that scripture in, in 2 Corinthians I says that, that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, I think that I've probably stood before that judgment seat many times in this life. And I've been judged of the Lord. And I'm judged according to the things that are written in this book when I fail to do the things that are written in this book. But... He does not punish us or exact from us what we deserve on account of our sin when we fail Him. And by the way, you know not all judgment is negative judgment. We hear, a lot of times we hear judgment and people cringe. Let me, let me tell you something. We all want to hear this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's a positive judgment. Enter into the joy of the Lord. 
And that's what we anticipate and we hope to hear uh, on the morning of the resurrection when we're gathered before God's throne. And we'll be welcomed. And, and He said, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And Jesus said in another place, He, he will tell the Father, Behold, Father, I and the children which thou hast given me, and I lost nothing. Ah, that's the God that I believe in. That's the God I believe that this Bible teaches and uh, the, I believe that uh, we're a blessed people if we can if we can come to if we can labor to enter into that rest and and realize that Jesus did it all. Now, because of that, let's serve Him. We, we let's do good works because of what He's done. And we know. And I, I put out something the other day on my Facebook page, and I got a lot of good answers. And that question was about that sign that I see when I drive to work every day. About the church that says, on an eternal mission. I, I don't think that anything that we do in this lifetime, good wor- as far as good works are concerned, has any impact on eternity whatsoever. I do know that if the, the non-elect, that their works, uh, that's going to have an impact on their eternity. But I don't think there's anything good that we can do in this life uh, that will have an impact on on eternal life because Jesus did it all. He did it well. He is a rock. His work is perfect. All His ways are judgment. Of God of truth without iniquity, just and right is He. That's what I believe that that this Bible teaches. Uh, But we're His... He's given us His Holy Spirit. We need to ask Him each and every day for direction, for guidance, for for instruction, for leadership, for help. There are times that I get I get in a place when I'm at work and something uh, something confronts me, and I say, "Lord, help me, help me," uh, and He does, and He does. But we need we need to learn to call upon Him every day and ask for the leadership of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to keep us, to, uh, to direct our steps. And we need to be as David uh, who said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If we don't know what this word teaches, we need to be reading it. We need to be hiding it in here. We need to be hiding it. Because I guarantee you the enemy is out to assault the throne of God. Now, you've heard me say on many occasions... And he says that the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, for lo, the kingdom of God is within you. If the kingdom of God is within us, in our hearts, then we have, we have a kingdom, then we, that means we have a dominion, and that we have a king. And he's sitting on the throne in our hearts. Uh, the, the enemy is working full time to try to dethrone Christ from our heart. And, and we, have a, we, can, we have a say in that warfare. If we're going to be obedient or not. If we're going to cast down the imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have, we have a fight to fight. And that's the fight that we have to fight to keep the devil out. And uh, don't let him dethrone God. I, I think the more that I think about it, the more that I study, the more that I meditate, I think that son of perdition. And it talks about that he sitting in the temple of God, shooing himself that he is God. I think that's not talking about... Uh, the, not necessarily talking about the Herod's temple that was destroyed in AD 70. I don't think it's talking about some future temple that the Jews want to build on, on uh, <clears throat> over there on uh, Mount Moriah. Well, the mount where the temple of uh, the Dome of the Rock is. They want to they want to rebuild that temple. They want to reinstitute it and uh, reinstitute the sacrifices and. and also that the son of perdition can sit there. The more that I think about it, it's, I think that Satan has always wanted to have control over God's people in their hearts. He says, I want, I want to, he says, I'll ascend to the heights, I'll ascend to the, to the throne of God. And, and I think that he has, he has probably overthrown um, uh, uh, the hearts of some people. And uh, because it's pretty obvious that they're not uh, they're not following the straight and narrow, or they're not following the difficult way. Anyway, there's a lot more that I could say about that. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what I'm going to preach on this morning. I haven't taken a text.
So I guess it's probably time for me to go ahead and sit down. I thank you all for your good attention. So we stand and sing a suitable hymn if David's ready. We're ready for you, David. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.